Well, as I mentioned already, <clears throat> this morning we're beginning a study in the Gospel of John. And certainly Gospels are always profitable. Actually, uh, probably uh, yeah, I, I, everything that, that God has given us in His Word is His Word. It's all profitable, but I do think particularly the Gospels because Jesus is more clearly revealed there than anywhere else. Now, we're going to read from the back of the book, and we're not going to go from the back forward, but this morning we're going to begin in the back of the book because here we see uh, you know, why it is John wrote the book. It's always important to know the purpose behind it as we go through it so that we can see how it is that John is fulfilling that particular purpose. So what I'd like to do is begin reading in John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And if I'm not mistaken in, uh, well, I guess I was mistaken. Let's back up to uh, verse 19. And we'll read through our text, which is basically verses 30 and 31. But here we see the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ, actually a couple of appearances after he was raised from the dead on the first day of the week. He appears to his disciples, and again, how much evidence, evidential power does the appearance of one who was crucified and clearly dead and in the grave for three days suddenly appearing alive, how much evidential power does that have to prove that Jesus is who he said he is? Well, again, we have eyewitness testimony to the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead, and John points to this as well as other things as the reason why we should believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. This is what we read. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst, in their midst, and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see... In his hands, the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, stood in their midst, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger, and see my hands. Reach here your hand, and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see, and yet believed. Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now we do understand the Lord means more than just believe that Jesus is who he said he was and that he is actually the Messiah of God. Believing entails much more than that. It means trusting Jesus to save you. It means turning from your sins that you may actually trust him. All of those things are wrapped up in this word, but John simply calls it believing. And that's what we're going to see here. It, it, as a matter of fact, the Greek word is an active word. All of this is implied in it, and we do need to understand that. So let's make sure we do understand that going into uh, this, this gospel. Well, again, as I already mentioned this morning, we're opening the gospel of John, and maybe we could ask the question, why this book? And we have 66 books in the Bible. We could go to any one of those. Why are we going to this particular book? Well, generally we're going here because it's the Word of God. And you know, it's a funny thing, but over 20 years ago, more like 25 years ago, when Don and I were looking for a church down in San Diego, we visited several churches and, and we found that very, very few of them, and that was 25 years ago, very few of them actually opened the Bible. 
and, and read from the Bible as, as the, you know, what it is they were going to be dealing with in the sermon. They usually opened up other books and started with other illustrations and maybe brought some of the scriptures in. Well, we read the Bible, we expound the Bible because it is the Word of God. This alone is the Word of God. All of it is profitable. All of it is going to help us be better Christians. And it's going to help us come to Christ if we don't know Him. It's going to help us learn more about God, more about His plan of salvation, and certainly more about what is good for us, what is best for us, and how we are to live. But more particularly, I wanted us to look at a gospel because in a certain sense, the gospels are more profitable than the other books in the Bible. And that's not in any way to depreciate the other books. They are all God's word. And they're all going to help us in many ways. But I think you would agree with me that reading the gospel may be more profitable than reading the book of Leviticus or reading perhaps Exodus, all of which may tell us about Jesus Christ in shadowy form but the gospel itself gives us the clearest possible view that we can have of the Lord Jesus Christ and help us in seeing him more clearly, to love him more, to trust him more, and so by his grace to become more like him. Now the gospels, again in general, you'll recall, are really eyewitness accounts to the life of Jesus Christ. Uh, what it is he did, what he taught, and so of course, who he was and who he is. You know, it's not just past tense, but present. Matthew was written by one of Christ's apostles who actually ministered with Jesus. He followed Jesus wherever he went. He saw what Jesus did. He heard what Jesus said firsthand, and he wrote it down in his gospel so that we also might know. Mark, as you know, was a very close associate of Peter. And for that reason, this, the gospel of Mark is actually considered to be Peter's account of the life of Christ because Mark himself did not accompany Christ, but he learned it most likely from Peter. Luke, as you know, was a close associate of the apostle Paul who actually went with him on many of his missionary journeys. Luke tells us that he put his gospel together by uh, interviewing eyewitnesses to these various things that Jesus said and did so that he could write them down and share them with a man by the name of Theophilus, uh, who many believed to be a Roman official who was a convert to Christianity. He wanted Theophilus to know who Jesus was and, and who he is, what he said, what he taught, but wanted him to know particularly what I think John wants us to know, that he is the Messiah. Now this gospel was written by John, another one of the 12 who accompanied Jesus in his three and a half year ministry who happens to be distinguished as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Doesn't mean that he was the only one that Jesus loved. I'm sure he loved all of his disciples just as he loves us. But for some reason, this is how he was distinguished in the life of our Lord Jesus. And we do know that uh, he did accompany Jesus in those particular times when Jesus sort of excluded the other disciples and brought his inner circle together. Now, why did John write his gospel? Well, first he wrote it for the same reason that the other three did, to be witnesses to the life of Jesus Christ. The Lord tells us that in a court of law, if you want to establish something, you need more than one person to do it. We read in Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, on the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. Well, the Lord didn't give us just two, and he didn't give us just three, but he gave us four Four witnesses to establish that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior of the world. Four eyewitness accounts, which, as we know, includes far more than just four eyewitnesses. The Bible tells us, actually, that 500 saw him at one time. But these were those who saw all that Jesus said, heard, or saw all that he did and, and heard all that he said. But we also recognize that each gospel has a more specific purpose than simply being an eyewitness. I mean, all the gospels are a bit different. Matthew's gospel appears to have been written in order to convince a specifically Jewish audience that Jesus is the Christ. And that's seen by the number of times that he quotes from the Old Testament to show how Jesus fulfilled the scriptures. To the Jewish mind, that would be paramount to, to see that Jesus is the Christ. Christ. 
Mark appears to have been directed toward a more Gentile audience because there's a number of times in his gospel where he, he, he goes to explain Jewish words and customs. Now, it doesn't mean that he didn't direct it to Jews, but if you have to explain it, it means that the audience is more than just Jewish. Let me give you one example in Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. The Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered together around him when they had come from Jerusalem and had seen some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands, that is, unwashed. And then in parenthesis, for the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. Now, if Mark were directing this to a purely Jewish audience, he wouldn't have to explain that because they all know what the Pharisees do. They're all very much aware of, of their traditions and so forth. Clement of Alexandria said in one of his writings that those in Rome who heard Peter preach insisted that Mark provide them with a written account of the life of Jesus Christ. Well, there you have it. Mark provided this for the Gentiles in Rome that they might know more about Jesus. But again, the connection between Mark and Peter. You know what, we see some of this going on in the Gospel of John as well. There are times where he's going to translate certain Hebrew words or maybe explain certain customs, which means that his audience also was enlarged to include Gentiles as well as Jews. And Luke, as we've already seen, wrote his Gospel to a Roman official by the name of Theophilus so that he might be instructed in the exact truth about the things which he had been taught. But what about John? Okay, why did John write his gospel? Well, I've already told you, it's no surprise. He tells us plainly in John 20, verses 30 and 31, Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John wrote this gospel in order to prove something, to prove to his readers, to prove to you who Jesus is, that you might have eternal life. Jesus is the only way. Now, in some ways, John is the simplest of all the Gospels. I mean, how many churches do you know when a new convert, somebody, you know, professes faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they give them the Gospel of John or they tell them, this is the one you need to read first. Years ago, when the particular church that Don and I were a part of were involved in the Billy Graham Crusade, we were trained to meet people who came to the front and we were to give them uh, not only the survey to fill out so that we could kind of put them in contact with other believers, so they could hopefully get planted into churches. But we were to give them the Gospel of John. They try to make sure that everybody gets a copy of this particular Gospel. And why is that? Well, if you re read the Gospel of John, you know that it's the simplest Gospel in, in one sense. It's the simplest English that any of the Gospels are written in. And there's a reason why that's the case. It's because the Greek that's behind it is the simplest Greek in all of the New Testament. The same is true of John's letters, you know, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation, which is also why if you happen to take uh, Greek, if you study Greek, uh, at least Biblical Greek, Koine Greek in a college or a seminary, when you're beginning, they assign you texts out of the writings of John to translate because they're the easiest ones. Now, why is this Greek so simple? Probably because John was a fisherman. That was his vocation. He wasn't you know, a heavily educated man. Now, it's interesting that Luke, on the other hand, his gospel and the book of Acts, which he also wrote, is written in very complicated Greek. It's difficult to translate. You have to get fairly advanced in your understanding of grammar and syntax before you even understand, plus vocabulary, to know what he's even writing about. And that seems to reflect his vocation as a physician. You see, he was an educated man, and so he writes at a higher level. Both of these Gospels were inspired by the same Spirit, weren't they? But the Spirit of God gave His Word that in, in such a way, through, through an, you know, the process of ins inspiration, that reflects the learning and the background of the author. It doesn't mean that one is more inspired than the other. It 
just simply shows us that, that man is involved in this, but the Spirit of God oversees and superintends what they're writing so that what they write down, though it does reflect their background, their learning, even something of their personality, it's still exactly what God wanted to be written. So John is very simple, very simple English, but don't let that fact fool you because John is also the most difficult gospel to understand. And that's likely because of what he's writing about, what it is he seeks to prove, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Some of it's very theological in what he has to write. His vocabulary is simple, but his thinking is very lofty. This morning, I just want to open with, with two things. First of all, how it is that John sets out to prove his point that Jesus is the Christ, and secondly, why John says it's important that you be convinced that he is right about Jesus. So first of all, how does John set out to prove that Jesus is the Christ? And let me just tell you, he does it this way. He does it by pointing to what Jesus said about himself. And then he points to what Jesus did, the signs, the miracles, to prove that what Jesus said about himself actually is true, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah. Now, I already told you that Matthew goes about it an entirely different way. He points to Jesus' family line. Jesus is born in the line of David. He is a son of David, a son of Abraham. He is the one who fulfills the scriptures, the, the one that the Old Testament prophets were pointing to, to make his point. But John argues in a different way. He points to the deity of Christ, that Jesus is the Son of God, and therefore he is the Christ. Now, you know that in the Old Testament, Jesus is revealed in, in many different ways. Jesus is called the Messiah, and that's the way he's referred to more than any other way, pretty much, in the New Testament. Uh, you probably know that Messiah is the Hebrew word behind the Greek word Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ is not the name of, of Jesus, as it were. So, I mean, Christ is not his last name. His name is Jesus, right? Christ is basically who he is. Messiah, he's the Messiah. He's the anointed one of God, the one that God sent into the world to save all who would trust him. That's what Christ means. But, of course, in the Old Testament, he's referred to as Messiah. Oh, really only twice, which is interesting. In Daniel 9, verses 25 and 26, he's called Messiah the Prince. And yet, this is the way that he is known to the Jews more than any other. In the Old Testament, Jesus is also known as the seed of the woman. We read in Genesis 3.15, the very earliest pronouncement of the gospel. God says to the serpent, And I will put enmity between you and the woman between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. The he there is the seed of the woman and that is Christ. He's also called the seed or the son of Abraham in Genesis 22, 18. He said, God says to Abraham, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And he is called the son of David in 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 to 13, where God is making his covenant with David. He says, when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendants after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. The seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the seed or the son of David. Jesus Christ is pictured many ways in the Old Testament as well. He is called the Lamb of God and that's what, um, you know, he's the Passover Lamb, which is a grand picture of how the blood of Christ was going to cause the angel of vengeance to pass over us. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, clean out the old leaven so that you will be or that you may be a new lump just as you are in fact unleavened for Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. He is the bronze serpent. We've already read in John 3, verses 14 and 15. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. The bronze serpent was a picture of Jesus Christ. 
And he's also known in the Old Testament as the suffering servant from Isaiah 53. In verse 7 we read, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. And let's not forget that the entire priesthood and ceremonial system, all the sacrifices, were all one grand picture of our Lord Jesus Christ, who he would be, what he would do in order to save us from our sins. But those really aren't the things that John picks up on in his gospel, though Matthew does a, a wonderful job of that. Because in the Old Testament, the Lord also made it quite clear who it is that Messiah was going to be, who this one is that would be the seed of the woman, the son of Abraham, the son of David. You know, he was more than a mere man, that he would actually be God in human flesh. And as I've said, this is the theme that, that John draws from. Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Uh, we read in our call to worship in Psalm 2 that he would be the Son of God, verses 6 through 8. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. And then we read in Psalm 110 verses 1 and 2 that this Messiah, this one who, to whom the government would be entrusted, is none other than the Lord himself. As a matter of fact, Jesus appealed to this passage when he, when he says David in the Spirit says that, that he is the Lord, that he is David's Lord. If he is David's Lord, how can he be his father? Well, this is the passage he quoted, Psalm 110 verses 1 through 2. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion saying, rule in the midst of of your enemies. So he is the mighty God, he is the father of eternity, he is the son of God, he is the Lord himself, David's Lord. As a matter of fact, you know the, the word Yahweh applies to all three persons of the Godhead. You see that Jesus is God in our nature is what John seems really to stress in his gospel. He says that he is the one who was in the beginning with God. We're going to see that when we get back to the, you know, the first chapter. The one who is God himself in John 1.1. 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. By the way, for those of you who need you know, some, some passages to prove you know, to a Jehovah's Witness that Jesus is God, you know, John's gospel is full of them. John says that Jesus is the God of creation. Verse 3, all things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. And what he means by that is that Jesus is the agent of creation. He's not the one that the Father creates through, but he is the one who creates himself. He is, not creates himself, but the one who creates all things himself, as it were. He is the one who spoke in the beginning, let it be. And it was. John goes on to say that he is the one who is one with the Father. In John 10, verses 29 through 30. My Father who has given them to me, that is, again, his sheep, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. He is the one whom, if you have seen him, you have seen the Father. In John 14, verses 7 through 9. Uh, where Thomas, um, well, okay, he says, If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, 
and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Now, when, when John, or when Jesus says that he and the Father are one, or when he says to Philip here, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, he's not saying, and neither is John saying for that matter, that Jesus is the Father. But what he is saying is that he and the Father are one being. We are one thing, one substance, and being one, they share the same holy nature. They are the same with regard to their holiness. And so he says, if you see him, you have seen his Father because they share that same, really that same love for what is good and what is right. He is God in human flesh. John wants us to know that. You know that John is also the only gospel where the uh, statements of Jesus Christ where he claims to be the I am are actually recorded. And as I mentioned earlier, I am is the name by which God revealed himself to his old covenant people. For instance, in Exodus 3, verses 13 through 14, then Moses said to God, behold, I am going to the sons of Israel and I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now I am is nothing other than simply the translation of the word Yahweh. It's basically the Hebrew verb to be. Jesus says to the Jews in John 8, 24, perhaps something I, I'm, perhaps you've heard this before, perhaps you haven't. But he actually calls himself by that same name. He says, therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Now, I'm not sure exactly how this reads. If you look in your translations, it's, it's not reflected up here, but if you look in your translations, the word he is actually italicized, which means the translator is including that word to try to make sense out of the passage, but Jesus literally says, you shall, uh, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. In verse 28 of the same chapter, he says this, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And then in verse 58, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. That is a, the clearest statement you're going to find. Jesus talking about his, not only his eternality, which is what is behind the word Yahweh, but that he is in fact the I am, the same God who sent Moses into Egypt in order to deliver the Jews from their bondage. Now this is what John says about Jesus. This is what Jesus claims about himself. But how do we know the claims of Jesus and the words of John are true? Well, in order to prove that they are true, John points to the miracles that Jesus did as evidence, as signs that point to his real identity because only God can do these things. And God is not going to allow anyone who's making the claim to be God to do these things unless what this person is saying is actually true. So the fact that Jesus is able to do these signs proves that he is the I am. It proves that what John says about him is true, that he is God in human flesh and therefore he is the Messiah because the Messiah is the Son of God. Now John does, I mean, I'm not gonna list everything that John says here, but let me just give you a couple of, of examples. And by the way, I should mention, John doesn't list everything that Jesus did. We've already seen in, in our text, John 20 verse 30. There are many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. I mean, look, look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You're going to find plenty more of the things that Jesus did. And John's going to be making allusions to those things, but he's not going to describe them all. And then in verse 20, or chapter 21, verse 25, and there are many, also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. He didn't list them all, but he did list some of them. Again, verse 31 of chapter 20. These have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Jesus says in John 
I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He's making an exclusive claim here to be the only way to God. Now, how do we know that what Jesus says here is true? Well, he proves it through a sign. He opens the eyes of the blind and lets the light in. John chapter 9, verses 5 through 7. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes, that is the blind man's eyes, and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. Jesus lays claim in John 6, verse 35, to being the bread of life. He says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Well, how did he prove that that was the case? Well, again, by doing something only God could do, by creating. He took five loaves and, and uh, five fish, or excuse me, five loaves and two fish, and he fed 5,000 men besides women and children. In John 6, verses 10 through 14, he says, have the people sit down. There was much, now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, a number about 5,000. Jesus then took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated, likewise also the fish, as, as much as they wanted. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. You know, it's the first time I noticed, but in this particular account, these are just the fragments from the five barley loaves. You know, the, the, this was a kid's lunch. So he didn't have even five big loaves. You can't eat that much for lunch. They're probably more like rolls. And Jesus fed 5,000 besides women and children and actually filled 12 baskets full of fragments that were left over. Now the people who saw it understood what that meant. This is the prophet who was to come into the world. They saw the sign and they know it was unmistakable. Here's the Messiah. So again, what is John's purpose? Well, his purpose is to prove that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. And I should just mention in passing that John also deals with other themes that we don't see as heavily emphasized in other Gospels, although we do see it in some of the epistles. Certainly, how it is that God saves. I think the sovereignty of God is emphasized in the Gospel of John. And he, he says more about the Spirit's work than any of the other Gospels as far as how he works in bringing someone to Christ, how he would send the Comforter, and what the Comforter would do for them and what he would do for the world. Some have called John's Gospel the Gospel of the Holy Spirit for that reason, because he too is revealed more clearly in this Gospel. But now let's get to the main point again in closing, and that's the second point let me just mention briefly. Why does John believe it's important that you and I be convinced that Jesus is the Christ, that he is in fact the Son of God, by the way, I want you to see those two go together. You can't be saved by a Jesus who isn't God. Okay? You have to believe that he is God in human flesh because that is the only Jesus. Why is it important that you believe that? Because, John says, your life, my life, depends on that very thing. Again, I would remind you, John writes in John 20, verse 31, these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now, the life that he's referring to here is eternal life. It's escape from judgment. Let's not forget what the Bible says about our condition as we come into the world. You and I came into this world under the sentence of death. And not just the fact we're going to die physically, but under the sentence of eternal death which is God's just punishment for your sins and my sins. John is writing what he is writing so that you may know the only way that you can escape, and that is through Jesus Christ. Again, I would remind you that most famous verse we read earlier this morning in John 3, 16 through 18. For God so loved the world, 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You see, how you deal with what John writes, how you deal with Jesus Christ is going to determine whether you're going to be judged for your sins or whether you're not going to be judged for them. I mean, Jesus died on the cross for a reason, and that is that he might take the judgment that was meant for all who would put their trust in him upon himself and suffer in their place. If you believe on the Son of God, if you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then Jesus took that judgment, that punishment for you. But if you don't, then you will have to suffer it for yourself. And that means an eternity in hell. If you haven't trusted Jesus Christ, you need to put your trust in Him. If you haven't turned away from what God says is wrong, and again, we don't, you know, we can't assume to ourselves God's prerogative of lawmaker and judge. He's the one who tells us what is good. He's the one who tells us what is bad. We need to accept His definition. If you haven't turned from your sins, from what He says is wrong, and if you're not trying to serve Him in everything that you do out of love for Him, then you are on your way to judgment, you see. You need Jesus Christ. But may the Lord show you that you do, and may you trust in Jesus while there's still time. That is what this gospel is going to do for you. This is what you need. But if, on the other hand, you've already turned from your sins, you've already turned from those things that you know are wrong, you've trusted Jesus Christ, and you are seeking to serve Him in everything that you do because you love Him, then this gospel is also for you because you love Jesus Christ. You want to know Him more intimately. May this gospel give you a refreshing view, a new view, a clearer view of the one who loved you and laid down His life for you. May the Lord apply His word to each of us as we need to hear it this morning. Let, let's bow in a moment of prayer and ask the Lord to apply this to us.